Dr. Iranda Gunathalaka, Senior Lecturer at the Faculty of Geomatics, Sarabagumo, University, Sri Lanka. He has a PhD in tidal monitoring and is chair of FIG Commission 4 on hydrography. He will speak on Sri Lanka's National Environment Plan, NDC, and surveying challenges and opportunities. So hello everyone. Yes. Thanks for the very brief introduction, Clarissa, once again. So during my presentation, I'll be talking about the Sri Lanka's National Environment Plan rather the national determined contributions in DCs related to the Paris Agreement and the contribution that we can make as surveyors in realizing them and some challenges associated with it. So this is the outline of my presentation. I will start with a brief introduction to some details about the Sri Lanka's NDCs and due to the time constraints I will not be able to cover all the aspects, but I will provide some key facts and some example cases will be discussed on surveyors role in that context. And finally, a brief summary will be presented. Okay. Well, Sri Lanka is ranked among one of the, the countries that are mostly vulnerable to climate change induced hazard. So being a tropical island nation in the Indian Ocean, Sri Lanka has consistently been placed among the top 30 countries at risk of extreme weather events by the Global Climate Risk Index. So the sectors that contribute significantly to the Sri Lanka's economy is such as like tourism, fisheries and agriculture are climate sensitive. So throughout Sri Lanka has been a low carbon emitting country with currently the per capita emission is about 1.9 tons per year and and still the, the policies are always like towards the remaining low carbon intensive so under the paris agreement the countries are determined themselves what contributions that they can make to achieve the aims of the treaty these plans are called national determined contributions so Sri Lanka submitted its initial NDCs in 2016 and the Paris Agreement long-term temperature goal is to keep the, the global mean temperature rise to maintain about 2 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial level somewhere back in late 1900 and preferably limit this value to 1.5 degrees as the optimum value or sustainable value to reduce the effect of the climate change. So that is the goal and to achieve that we have to stop, immediately stop, you know, reducing the, the greenhouse gas emission as soon as possible to reach this net zero level by 2050. So actually the Paris Convention does not emphasize or specifies what to do and how to do it, but it's rather the countries that has the freedom to contributing to fulfill the gaps of the current state to the ideal level through various strategies and commitments to the NDCs. So that is really important with this Paris Agreement. So in Sri Lanka, this has been done with the, the leadership is taken by the Climate Change Secretariat under the Ministry of Environment. So NDCs were defined under three main uh, spectrums. First one is the mitigating NDCs which present an increased ambition for the greenhouse gas emission reduction. Targeting in Sri Lanka, they are targeting the six major sectors which is energy, transport, industry, waste and uh, forestry and agriculture. So then comes the adaptation NDCs which represent long-term policy goals for Sri Lanka to ensure that the country is protected from the adverse impact of the climate change. Then the third sector is loss and damage. The climate related hazards pose significant threat to Sri Lankan economy as well as social development. So according to the projections by 2050, the damage will be about 1.2% of the GDP. So further to that, all the indices must be aligned with the at least one or several UN sustainable development goals. So despite low, the low carbon footprint and highly vulnerable status, Sri Lanka commits 
committed to increase its forest cover up to 32 percent by 2030 the current level is about 29 percent in the case of uh, 2015 uh, statistics so and reduce the greenhouse gas emission by 14.5 percent during this decade from the power transport industry waste forestry and agriculture sector combined so in order to realize these ambitious targets sri lanka further committed to achieve 70 percent renewable energy in the power sector by the end of 2030 and to achieve carbon neutrality by 2015 in the power generation further sri lanka has already launched the following major initiatives such as uh, banning single-use plastics adopting colombo declaration on sustainable nitrogen management as well as promoting organic fertilizer and farming and also promoting immobility and circular economy etc so here for your information i'm presenting some example indices and their actions and the targets related to power sector so this is just for your information and how they are aligned and what are the targets and the deadlines so sri lanka has reached nearly 100 percent electrification in around 2016 and out of 35 percent are power is generated from the renewable sources like hydropower wind solar and biomasses but the majority of the power generation is still goes or relies with the coal and the oil based thermal power so that in addition to that the demand for the electricity is extend, you know, expected to grow annually about five percent and it is expected to implement the NDCs with respect to the greenhouse gas emission reduction by 25 percent as business as usual scenario in the power sector by 2030 and this slide is again another summary of NDCs including so this one is highlighting the the key corresponding agencies and the other agencies are associated with it and the key performance indicators and the targets timelines are mentioned under each activity so this is quite helpful in following up or you know keep track on the activities and as well as NDCs as well as to monitor them effectively so here on us, I'll be discussing some example NDCs and its relevance to the surveys so in my title it says the challenges and opportunities so in generally surveys have no big role to play in the mitigation NDCs compared to the significant contribution has to be played in the adaptation NDCs so I'm taking the coastal and marine sector adaptation NDCs for as an example so in that there are four main you know NDCs defined under that NDC 1 is to establish accurate sea level rise forecasting system for Sri Lanka number two is prepare the updated vulnerability maps for the coastal areas then adapt the optimal shoreline management works as well as the fourth one is identify and declare the coastal and marine natural areas that are priority for building resilience for climate change impact so this is really important so let me briefly go with the next slide which is explaining about the NDC1 in quite in detail so here is are the sub activities that is associated with the NDC1 which is establishing an accurate sea level rise forecasting system for Sri Lanka so under this activity there should be a database to be established with the historical tidal levels by 2023 and then measure and record the present sea level mean sea level and assess and publish sea level rise results by 2025 along with that to identify the established ad the additional you know tidal measurement stations to be you know cover the substantially cover the coastline as well as you know adding additional sensors also to be completed uh, should be completed by 2023 finally to estimate the sea level rise projection for sri lanka using global best practices so that should be completed 2025 so in all these activities the service role is essential in compiling the historical data collecting the present data and analyzing them for effective decision making so in sri lanka 
the primary agencies are National Hydrographic Office, Survey Department or National Survey Agency in Sri Lanka, Sri Lankan Navy, Port Authorities, Coast Conservation Department and of course including the universities are involved with this. So the contribution of all these related stakeholders is key in successful implementation of these activities. So here it is mentioned that the challenges associated with the same NDCs related to sea level rise estimation. So currently there are about seven tidal stations running since 2015, which are the new stations. Unfortunately, we don't have long term running stations like some other countries. And we want to further densify the network by adding another two stations as well as we want to add backup sensors to each and every station that currently we are running in case of you know, you know failures and all that. So, so far what the best data we can collect was from Colombo uh, Stillingwell type tide gate that was running continuously since 1980s. So, there are about 40 years plus tidal data continuously collected but still as you can see in the screen there are gaps here and there. So in, on top of that, another challenge that we face in Sri Lanka is our vertical data was established sometime, you know, somewhere back about 100 years uh, time ago during the colonial period. So since then, we haven't done any revalidation or assessment. So as, as we are, you know, continually, you know, doing some constructions and expansion works in the coastal areas as well as Nowadays, we have a lot of activities going on, big uh, developments going on Colombo port as well as port city in Colombo. So we need to have an assessment of what is the actual mean sea level up to date. So we have done some experiment and in some places uh, in the coastal area and we have found out this, the sea level has risen over the years up to 12 to 14 centimeters from its original level in some early 1900. So as an opportunity, as a solution for the previous challenges or the lack of data for the sea level rise estimation, said that ultimate data can be effectively used as an alternative. So this is now commonly used in most part of the world as well as the scientific community has widely accepted it as a method. So we did the comparison with the ultimate sea surface height and observed tide for the same period for 20 years and we did a correlation test and it was very well matched like 0.87 correlation for the 20 years data as you see in the graph. And then a sea level rise trend map was generated for the Sri Lankan waters using the ultimate multi-mission satellite ultimate data. Obtain and the obtained sea level rise is between 2.5 to 3 millimeters per year, as you can see in the map. And then, similarly, we did another study with the observed tide from the Colombo using the 40 years data, and that rate was about 3 millimeters for the same period, so more or less they are closely matching. And then, moving on to the second example of the NDCs about the coastal sector which is preparation of the vulnerability maps for the coastal belt of Sri Lanka. So the related activities are to update the inundation maps covering the coastal area according to the sea level rise forecast by 2024, to prepare sea level rise influence risk map for the coastal zone and take appropriate actions to be completed by 2025. And based on those updated existing coastal development setbacks to be revised by 2026. So these are the plans related to the NDC2 in the coastal sector. So here the greatest challenge or the problem that we face in Sri Lanka is unfortunately there is no high resolution digital elevation models or data that we can use to create such high resolution dims especially related to this type of uh, studies. So only 5 to you know, 10 meter contour maps are available with our national mapping agency in 10,000 and 50,000 scale. 
So this is really inadequate in modeling such micro scale phenomena like sea level rise. Of course, if you use conventional survey techniques, it will take ages to complete. So as an option, we need to go for rapid data collection measure, which can be derived centimeter level accuracy in, in, a, in a quick double quick time so that to overcome these challenges, the options are we can use UAVs, LIDARs, as well as high resolution satellite images. So we have done a pilot study uh, to see the capability of UAV photogrammetric techniques in one of the famous tourism hotspots in southern part of Sri Lanka, which is called Goal. And we achieved 3 cm digital elevation model accuracy. And as you can see in, in the other photographs, you can see clearly the blue line, which is the line. Uh, of the sea level in 2100 years time. So anything below that will be inundated. So as a summary, since we committed many NDCs covering various sectors, while some are directly associated with special data, there are many serving opportunities and solutions available for the in the world today. So as a developing country, we are facing several challenges in realizing those effectively. So some of the key points to be noted as follows. So lack of long-term continuous tidal data to determine the actual sea level rise is challenging. Use of modern serving techniques in generating accurate digital elevation models, especially in required in assessing the climate change impacts and mitigation planning. So problems in retrieving the historical data and from the respective agencies due to the poor achieving method is also a challenge. So it says data is available, but once we see it, they can't find the data or the, the data is there and the metadata is missing. So it's a big problem. So we want to combine all the data and have a kind of a time series data. So cooperation between agencies is also critical due to various institutional costs custodians like sharing the data and many other issues are so to be solved in the policy level. So in collaboration with the regional and the global centers are also essential like especially like the sea level data like PSMSL or activity data from ABSO or GLOSS so on. And establishing a working teams and national committees are also crucial for each NDCs to smooth the running and you know assessing the progress and all that and lastly some capacity building programs are needed to support to achieve the NDCs as this has to be done in national level and many agencies are involved with this and we should, one should follow the same standard and same uh, procedures. So all these key points related to serving are essential in real you know, realization of the NDCs effectively and fight against climate change. So at the end as surveys we have a huge role to play as we provide all the baseline data and critical information for better decision making. So with that let me remain and I'm also happy to you know be with you in during the breakout room for your further questions. Thank you.